All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Um, so we uh, have one more bill that we've been working on um, to try to wrap up our work before uh, all bills turn into pumpkins today, with it being the crossover deadline. <laughs> so uh, we have a number of witnesses with us um, to uh, give us more context, help us understand, especially the move uh, in our um, Criminal Justice Council recommendations for Law Enforcement Officer Training Committee bill. Um, there were questions that the committee had around the move from a fixed number of hours requirements, especially in fair and impartial uh, and bias training to uh, demonstrate competency. So um, I want to welcome uh, to tee up some of this testimony, Executive Director Simons and uh, Deputy Director Raquel from uh, Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Thank you all so much for being back and, and bringing some guests to help us understand uh, this move and trends in law enforcement officer training. Good morning and thank you for having all of us. For the record, Heather Simons, Executive Director, Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, I would like to um, want to introduce to you um, subject matter experts that can weigh on in this topic. And I think if it's all right with you, just weigh in, weigh in again at the end and give them the time to bring you the context that I think that you're looking for. Um, two of them are uh, from iAtalyst. Um, John Blum is, well, let me just first say, I, I spoke to John this morning, Brian Grisham, I haven't spoken to you yet, and apologies if I tracked you down in Dubai. I think you told me that you were going to be over there, but um, thanks for being here. And uh, both of them, um, Brian is the uh, deputy director for iAtalyst, and John Blum is also a consultant with iAtalyst and um, both of them are on the road all the time. So I just brought that up. So uh, you know that the, you know, the turnaround time was a little short, but um, I think that you're gonna find the context and expertise that they bring to this discussion around law enforcement training to be relevant and helpful. And I believe that Dr. Eitan Nazareth Longo is also on and he is um, director of uh, Fair and Impartial Policing for Vermont State Police, does a fair amount of Fair and Impartial Policing training as an additional duty to his uh, director duties. Um, uh, that includes consulting with command and um, stakeholder discussions around policy, uh, traffic stop data, race data, and much more. And I would like for them to spend each of them spend at least a minute and introduce themselves in terms of their experience, and I can weigh in at the end. Uh, Representative Pingo has a quick question. Quick question: What is iAtalyst? Oh yeah, uh, that would be a great thing. I think uh, for um, one of your guests, maybe to just uh, tell us also about what iAtalyst is and, and set that table. We had touched on it briefly, but um, I think. We had a break and we've been working on other bills so it'd be important to go back yep. and set the context again yes apologies i um i have this isn't the first time i've gotten feedback on using acronyms and not explaining them so thank you for bringing that up and i will i will just i mean if it's okay i'll toss it to john and let him let him uh take it over is that all right and to include explaining what iatalyst is <laughs> sounds like a plan thank you so okay. much director Simons. Yep. thank you at the expense of confusing this, I'm a person of chain of command, and I'm going to punt this over to Brian since he is the deputy director of Atlas to let him tell you guys what, what it's about. Well, Thanks, thank Dr. you, John. I'm, I'm not in Dubai. I'm back home in Tennessee. I'm Brian Grisham. I'm the deputy director of Atlas. It's a membership organization of uh, primarily all of the post directors in the United States, but we've gone international um, in our many years of experience of experience. Um, I'm, I retired two years ago as the director of post in Tennessee and uh, joined the IATLAS as their deputy director. Uh, as I said, we're a membership organization of post directors and academy directors. Um, we advocate uh, minimum standards uh, for training, hiring, and uh, retention 
purposes for law enforcement officers uh, worldwide. And uh, as, I, as I said, we've, um, we've got membership in every state and territory of the United States. And um, uh, that's kind of what we do. Um, we um, um, certify training on a national level. We do academy uh, audits and academy accreditation, post-commission accreditation, and um, uh, our subject matter experts on curriculum development also. So I'll, I'll kick it to John to, to tell him his part of it. And as we're acronym busting here, uh, you are the yeah. International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training. That is I add a list. <laughs> that is quite a mouthful. Not a mouthful, yes. Go ahead, go ahead, John. <laughs> Not a problem. Hello, everybody. My name is John Blum. I'm coming to you from the Raleigh, North Carolina area. A uh, little bit about me. I've got 33 years of law enforcement experience. I was a sworn officer with the city of Winston-Salem, which is about 700 officers. Um, I was also a training commander for the Garner, North Carolina Police Department, which is a small suburb of Raleigh. I also went to the North Carolina Department of Justice, and I was responsible for their, their basic law enforcement training curriculum that's mandated throughout the state of North Carolina. There are currently 55 delivery sites. So I'm familiar with Vermont and you guys train at one place. If you can imagine 55 deliveries throughout the state of North Carolina, it can be, be very cumbersome. Um, I spent the last 10 years essentially building evidence-based curriculums for state posts, um, the US Department of Justice, the COPS Office, International Association of Chiefs, the police, uh, I do training needs assessments for large agencies, which included uh, New Jersey State Police, um, agencies that have been under consent decrees like the Newark, New Jersey Police Department. My wheelhouse, I guess if you could put it in a nutshell, is that I, I develop curriculum and training that's evidence-based and legally defensible, and then I help agencies ensure that that training is delivered appropriately. You look for the metrics that show that the training is effective and that performance is being that you're you're getting what you want out of the training. Um, that's kind of I write for a living, I write for a living now. If you if, if to put it in a, in a nutshell, and and most of all, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thanks for joining us. And um, I wanted to give uh, Eitan, um, Dr. Nasred Longo, the opportunity to introduce himself as well. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing him on Monday uh, at the. Uh, forum in St. Albans. So uh, appreciate seeing you again. Oh, you're on, you're on mute. There Hello. you go. Yes. Yeah, sorry. They, I, I never understand this. Um, <laughs> for the record, I am um, Dr. Eitan Nasred Longo. I am a co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing and Community Affairs for the State Police, an equity advisor for the Department of Public Safety, and I am also chair of the Attorney General's um, advisory panel on racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system. Oh, uh, Representative Marowicki, go ahead. Quick question, Eitan. Do you have power back on uh, at home? <laughs> Finally, yes. Um, it's nice not to be living with a flashlight. Yes, thank you, Michael. <laughs> Our town got hit pretty hard. Uh, uh, yeah, th this was a he couple of heavy snow days, so I'm glad the power's back on. Good, uh, very, very Vermonty question for those of you who are in places like Tennessee. Um, we've uh, gotten gotten quite a bit of snow and had a lot of folks out for a long time with the power. So, making sure everybody's safe is the number one priority. Um, so, I'll I'll let uh, you all um, tell us how you would like to proceed. I think the, the committee has been looking at um, the recommendations of the Criminal Justice Council. If you've taken a look at the, the latest draft of um, the drafting re request 230959, our bill, um, the really key piece uh, that we wanted to discuss a little bit more and get more context on is this move away from a fixed number of hours to uh, competency and how we measure that demonstrated and how it'll affect the future of um, the training at the academy. So uh, I would love for you to tell us that story and, and whichever voices you think are most appropriate. Uh, I might let Director Simons kind of facilitate and I'll turn it over to you. No problem. 
Um, they all they all have seen the latest draft, um, as have I. Um, without taking too much time, this um, takes training to a, a completely different level. We don't only support it, but this is a very exciting proposition for cutting edge training and stability and operations. And I'll give it over to John and he'll, he'll tell you basically why we love it um, and what the structure is for measurable evidence-based training around skills. Yeah, thank you, Heather. So first of all, let me commend the state of Vermont on being innovative with uh, the competency and skills based. Uh, my experience is this, and that law enforcement tends to equate the number of hours with quantity, with quality. I've seen curriculums that that are in state posts that have, they say they have a thousand hours of training, but the content is not evidence based. There's no performance or skill based assessment tools or metrics to quantify what they're learning. Um, even in my own home state of North Carolina, we have annual in-service training. They mandate it for 40 hours and then they pick these topics. And then they say, well, we're gonna have four hours on X topic and four hours on, on another topic. The problem with that is that we never, you, hours do not drive training. The training and the curriculum and what you want the student to learn drives the number of hours. So to make something more competency and skill based is moving in the right direction because you're trying you're going to be focused on what you want the students to learn, not how many hours they sit in the classroom. Um, that can tend to scare a little folks because people think that might be a reason to reduce the number of hours. Um, from my experience, we tend to cram. 15 pounds of stuff into a five pound bag when we're teaching and we never give it enough time. So I have found that when you build content and allow the, the content to drive the number of hours, the number of hours tend to go up higher. They don't, they don't go lower. So from Vermont's perspective, if there's any concern that, that, that going to a competency and skill base will reduce the number of hours, I, I, I in my experience, that would, would not be the case. Thanks, John. I think um, next, Brian, if you could talk about defendable training and high liability and the impact on um, on you know how we build evidence based training and connect it to the work, and then take it wherever you want. You're the expert. Well, I mean, I, I didn't. I was trying to be brief, but yeah, I'm an attorney, um, uh, long long time legal instructor here. And when you um, base all of your training on a job task analysis from the very first step um, and draw these evidence-based uh, results that you, you want to achieve, you, you develop defensible training practices rather than, than just a, uh, a checkbox. Uh, like John said, we tend to um, want to mandate hours and for non-subject matter experts, that's that's a reasonable approach. It certainly will will uh, uh, express the concerns of a legislative body or a post commission uh, in in what they feel is important uh, an important amount of time in the overall scheme of things. <clears throat> but then again, as John said, we've got some states that um, uh, I've queried that that have. Uh, huge number of mandated hours and I ask uh, why, why do you have that certain number of hours well because Indiana um, had uh, had about that number of hours and we wanted to be a little higher so uh, it, it needs to be boiled down to what the officers do what they need to do how they need to interact with the public and um, and then find a, a scientific way to measure that um, so um, all, all of this gives you a more defensible practice than, um, than just uh, a checklist of hours uh, to accomplish. Representative Waters Evans has a question. Thank you. Could you explain what you mean when you say defensible? Like yeah, what? Yeah. Legally defensible, so that's a good question. So to make a curriculum legally defensible, um, what you want to have is data to support why you're training X topic. 
So one of the things that I think Vermont is on the cusp of doing is what we call refer to as a statewide job task analysis to to know what cops need to be trained on. We need to ask them what they're currently doing in the field. And we ask them specific questions, large survey questions. It typically takes about an hour, hour and a half to to go through these surveys between first line supervisors and line officers. And we collect that information based upon what they're doing. And we take that data and then um, uh, let me digress here. Here would be a great example from a basic academy curriculum. We, we tend to do is survey officers with less than five years of on the job experience. And so what happens is that when you ask them if they're conducting homicide or murder investigations, what you find out the answer to that question is no, they're not because this is a ba because it's basic academy or entry level. And so you don't have a curriculum that focuses on how to conduct a homicide investigation because that's more advanced training. So the, the curriculum is driven by what the men and women are actually doing in the field. And when you do it that way, that gives you a legal basis and a foundation to stand on as to why cops are trained or officers are trained on X topic because the data supports that. Does that make sense? Thank you, yes. And, and I wanted to, and I, I kind of got sidetracked on from what Brian was mentioning earlier to layer on top of that, the move that Vermont is, is and wants to make, what it allows the state to do is what I refer to as an ROI and what law enforcement doesn't do enough of. What's the return on investment for your training? For example, there's a huge move on de-escalation training and we need to have four hours of de-escalation training or eight hours of de-escalation training. And while de-escalation training is critical and we need to, to, net, to nail down the specific skills and competencies for that, what we also want to do is say, well, they've had training X amount of hours. And what's the metric that we're going to show that that training actually improved performance? Law enforcement doesn't do a lot of that. We just basically go, we're going to give them four hours of training on X topic and that's going to be our Band-Aid and everything is going to be better now. Well, that's not necessarily the case. We want to provide training and then we want to quantify that training and say, okay, well, we had X number of hours on this topic and performance was in, when in, performance improved, community relations improved by X metric after that training. So by going to a skills and competency based formula, you're, you can measure with greater accuracy, accuracy the return on investment for your training. Would it be fair to, to say that it's the difference between saying, yes, this person sat in a chair or, you know, watched a series of, of instructional Zooms uh, for X number of hours versus this person showed us that they were, that they understood this content and, and could do these things? <clears throat> yes, sir. Great statement. We refer to that as check the box training versus they sat there through the classroom, they've got it, but did they really learn anything? And that comes down to the testing criteria as well. So when we talk about building a curriculum, what we wanna do is when we talk about skills and competencies, it's not just written tests, it's actually practical skills and rubrics that measure performance in a role-playing or situational type of training. So it's not just sitting in a chair, we wanna engage in more hands-on practical experience that mirrors what they would do in the field. So that, that would be another component of why skills and, and competency-based approach is more effective. What does the testing look like for skills like fair and impartial policing? How do you, how do you actually measure that? Um... Well, there's, lo there's lots of ways you can measure that. Um, you can we can you can do role play scenarios in my in my my experience or in my opinion to to train someone on fair and impartial policing it's not just a that in itself in itself is not just a standalone topic that would be something that you would fuse throughout an entire curriculum it would be something that would be reinforced throughout the employment life cycle and things that so you're you're creating a culture of fair and impartial policing not just this standalone topic it, it, itself. That's that's kind of my opinion on that. So that includes role play scenarios. That includes community engagement. Uh, that includes um, on the job training, actually during field training, things of that nature. So there's a lot of other 
there's several approaches you can take to that, not just one where you sit in a class and you make them spit out and, and read a, a multiple question test. There's lots of different ways you can do that. So I'll just uh, jump in and then hand it over to um, Dr. Nasret and Longo. I, I think that th that's an excellent question. And thank you, John, for breaking that for breaking that down, the measurables with fair and impartial policing. And I think what you're gonna hear from Dr. Nasret and Longo is that fair and impartial policing also needs to be defined as part of the work and the number of sub topics that fall underneath it. But when it comes to interaction um, the, and evidence-based training, the, it's what we would call consensus consensus discussion in that we have to agree on what respectful behavior looks like. We have to agree on what least uh, forceful looks like. And a lot, a, a lot of times those, that skill building structure is done um, as a group with professionals that will bring in um, the various levels of empathy to the work. So in other words, how do you feel when you're respected? What does it look like when you're treated professionally and um, and uh, what does it look like and feel like when you're safe? And I think that's where the break that the breakdown and a lot of communication training is that the receiver of the you know the receiver of the information will feel a certain way, but there won't be agreement on whether um, the officer was being respectful or safe or professional. And what this training design does, it allows for us to build an agreed upon continuum of behaviors that we know are and are not in those categories. And that is an ongoing misunderstanding that it's too soft to measure, but it's really not, particularly um, when we build empathy into it. And I'll give it over to Aton to undo anything I said that was down the wrong road, but I think we're on the same page, doctor. Yeah, I think we are too. Um, I'm sorry, was there, somebody had a comment? No, just a sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> there was a big sneeze. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> I've had my own classroom since 1987 and I have never, ever once uh, looked at a student and said, well, you get an A because you've been here for three hours a week for the last 10 weeks. That just doesn't happen. It's absurd. It's completely absurd. It's at odds with everything we know about education. Um, and I was delighted to read the bill because it allows for a lot of room to expand upon what we already do. Um, I was really pleased to hear, um, I'm sorry, is it Dr. Blum? Um, I, I, no, sir, that, no, sir, just John. Okay, John. <laughs> I was delighted to hear what he was talking about when he was saying you know, that uh, some of the testing could be based on scenario. Um, we've been working to do that. Um, we've been working at trying to get that in and have had trouble because we have X number of hours. Um, a lot of the class that I um, run has to do with basically, I mean, I've developed it in um, consultation with a research psychologist. A lot of it is social psych 101 before we get to talking about bias. Um, why there may be a biological basis for bias, in fact. Um, we need the expansibility that the bill currently, at least your draft bill, I should say, currently includes so that, in fact, we can come up with a kind of teaching that is more responsive to current situations and thus more responsible. Um, and we, um, Director Simons and I have been talking about this, I don't know, it feels like every night for the past three years, um, of trying to come up with that kind of um, model for the kind of education we're doing around fair and impartial policing. We've also been talking a great deal about, uh, and there's been a lot of work going on at the Academy concerning how to 
bring fair and impartial policing, as John was saying, into all aspects of training that go on at the academy. That is an ongoing process. But again, it's not about number of hours. It's about making sure there are certain skills and certain competencies. When something goes wrong, no one stops and looks and says to the cop, how many hours have you had on this? That's not it. They talk about how what kind of skills people have. Um, and I think that this bill gets much more to the heart of what we're trying to do, both as law, law enforcement professionals and as activists. The other point that I would say is important to bear in mind is that there are direct connections between speaking about um, skills and competencies and um, transparency to the communities that have been um, un not either underserved or badly served by law enforcement. Um, and I think that that's an important fact that we haven't really um, yet mentioned. So uh, Dr. Nasser and Laga, I think you bring up a really good point um, that we, we want as the legislature to make sure that we're staying true to the desire that was in the, the creation or the expansion of the Criminal Justice Council um, to, to stay really rooted in modernizing our approach, having a greater lens toward racial justice and equity in the training of law enforcement. Um, and so part of the anxiety uh, that, I, that I think we have over some of the removal of the hours of fit training in particular was that that was like a, the bluntest instrument that, that the legislature could use at the time we wrote that language that was that's being struck here. That was the blunt instrument we were using to say, you got to do this. You got to make sure our law enforcement gets trained on this stuff. Uh, and I'm hearing you say really emphatically that it's time to move beyond that. I, yes, I do believe it is time to move beyond that, but may I also submit to you that you can have your cake and eat it too. Um, <laughs> there is no reason that these are mutually exclusive, diametrically opposed issues. You could say something, and I'm doing this off the top of my head with absolutely no caffeine this morning, um, something to the effect of, you know, a requisite not to be less than a requisite number of hours. You could keep that language in there, but say something to the effect of, but we, you know, that there will be more of a focus on skills and competency rather than just this number of hours. You could have it both ways. Yes. And that way you're making everyone who's, you know, nervous about, oh my God, they're going to strip it down to an hour. I just know that they're going to do that. And you, you made them comfy, you know, wrapped them up in a place, yeah. made them all very happy and warm. And then you can like go on to what we actually think we need, which is more of a focus on skills and competencies. See a hand up for Mr. Bloom, but uh, just before you, before you go, uh, represent Hango. Um, thank you. I have a question that I'm not sure one of you are going to be able to answer or if I think it's up to us as legislators to make this decision. But in the um, interim, when this transition is occurring, will we have both um, number of hours and competency? Because clearly it's going to take you all a long time to come up with the curriculum and to get it right. So what happens in that in that downtime when you're working on the curriculum? We'll, st we'll stick to what we have and we'll continue to develop training. Not all training is mandated. And I don't want us to forget that, you know, leaders, leaders want us to have measurable training so that they can um, that, you know, that's another layer of accountability operationally and with personnel. But we can continue to do um, what I would consider to be the minimum, which is just a couple, you know, just in these two topics, a couple of hours every other year. But there's already more training developed and uh, 
agency heads are um, using that training and uh, using the forum of local training, regional training, um, conferences. So this this shouldn't get in the way of professional professional development anywhere. And and many of them are already, you know, they've been doing this. This is. I just want to make sure that folks know that there are, you know, ve there's very steady leadership in this state in law enforcement. And uh, they're very aggressive about making sure that they are um, in line with best practices, um, in step with their uh, community and the needs for training around that. And this is really, this is just, this is the basic nuts and bolts. And what um, John Blum is talking about is also, um, this is a way for us to bring back to you proof that this is happening in most training anyway. We just haven't had we just haven't had the resources or the plan to uh, bring you the document that says this is the training and this is what we're doing and this is how we're meeting this need. And that goes along with the job task analysis, accreditation, national certification. You're going to find that much of what we do already is there, but we needed that structure to do it. This shouldn't slow anything down or excuse any attendance or lack of attendance. Thank you. So I guess my question for us is how do we know when the number, the compulsory number of hours is going to be stopped? Do we put a, a deadline on this? How do we know how the rollout is going to happen? So the, the bill as written contemplates striking the number of hours completely. Which is why we're really holding this, this conversation so explicitly here now as we're looking to, to potentially move the bill this afternoon. So the bill as it stands says, okay, we know that these concepts are being trained. We're gonna hear from, you know, we have heard from and we'll hear additionally from law enforcement leaders and stakeholders um, that are very interested. And I think, you know, Dr. Nazareth and Lago, a lot of his work um, with the RDAP um, and with a couple of hats that he wears you know, could tell us more about this. There's a stakeholder interest in making sure that this training happens and it is happening to Dr. Simon's point. But what we have in the bill right now is saying, okay, we see that that training is happening. We know that you're embarking on increased um, focus on this, but you need flexibility in the creation of the curriculum to weave these things in instead of having them be these separate blocks. And so what our, what our bill has to be really explicit and answer your question, Representative Hango, is no requirement for a number of hours. But Representative Waters Evans and our team uh, has worked on a report for us when we come back in January so that we're reminded and do a check back to say, how's this going? And I think um, we'll hear, and what I assume we will hear is that um, there's been you know uh, increased flexibility in the curriculum has been given and that what's going to be taught at the current and future uh, rounds of the academy is that um, we've moved toward this competency base and that the the number of hours spent specifically on fit uh, on the fair and impartial policing training uh, is kind of woven throughout the curriculum but i don't know if if, if Aton or heather if you want to follow up on that correct anything that i said that's wrong <laughs> yeah. um if i may just interject here um let me beg you by all that is holy not to put a date by which the transition will be accomplished please for the love of god do not do that <laughs> um it, it we are already working on this there are so many people who are already working on this. Um, that will simply add a level of stress to the work that is unnecessary. It is wholly, wholly and totally unnecessary. Um, I, I, I don't know what else to say about that. The, the other thing that I would like to point out um, to expand on a comment I made earlier, um, when you're speaking with community members from disadvantaged communities, communities that have been ill-served by law enforcement within the state, when an issue comes up, 
it is not solved by talking to the community members by saying they had X number of hours of training. It is in fact approached by discussing the character of the training and what people said at it, not necessarily using their names, but things of that nature. Um, thus, this change that you all are considering gets way more to the issues of accountability and transparency to historically stigmatized communities within the state. I would also point out that right now the state is in the process, and I'm on that committee too, of putting together a Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, that will be looking at questions like this, in fact. Um, and again, then any kind of change that needs to be made, uh, putting a time on it, a date on it, 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 it's just not, it's kind of beside the point. Oh yeah, and I, I just want to be clear and then I'll go to Representative Samuel and Waters Evans that the, the uh, we just wanted to have a, a note for ourselves to check back in with a report on the progress, not a, not a, hard, not a hard date at all. Okay. But the, the language in here, I was just referring to the report back. That's not a, that's not a hard and fast requirement. In fact, the other thing the bill does is, you know, it, it pushes out and gives more flexibility around the, the um, transition and, and adoption of um, alternate routes to becoming certified. So um, we're actually trying to, in the bill, we're trying to provide more flexibility for the criminal justice council, the training world. But go ahead, Representative Hanga. Thank you. No, I didn't mean in any way to imply that there would be a date on this. However, that all being said, I am not comfortable with just completely striking and dropping the current requirements without knowing what the new requirements are going to be. And are the folks who are entering the academy now as of, well, as of the passage of the bill, let's say, um, will that new class be trained in this same way as a class, for instance, three years from now when you've um, finish developing this new curriculum? I don't think so. Um, and I am worried about standards. Um, while I support the concept of going to competency-based training, I am very hesitant to drop all of today's requirements just by striking it in this bill. And um, that's why I requested to hear more from folks who do training. And I appreciate that the chair has called you in. If I, if I may respond to that, um, I, you know, I think that's a, that's a legitimate concern and um, we appreciate the question. Uh, these topics, for example, fair and impartial policing, domestic violence, um, they receive the mandated requirement at the academy and many, many hours more. That includes practice, scenarios, real life situations, review and additional topics on top of just the baseline. So to, to Dr. Nazaret Longo's point, um, we are already doing this. So I, I can't, as training subject matter experts, we don't feel good just doing the basics. So we've been doing more of that for some time. What we need to do is legitimize it, certify it, standardize it so that we all know that we're talking about the same thing. And anybody on the job will tell you that that interaction between, between them and whoever they're dealing with is where the practice has to really come. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the actual training at the academy, the initial training that an, a recruit receives, that will not change from the number of hours that currently are being specified? Well, we've been doing more than those mandated hours for some time. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to tighten it up and make sure that um, we focus on not just the skill, but also that you know what the skill is. That's what this does. I understand that, but what I am asking is, will the number of hours that a recruit initially receives in certain subject areas change, or will those requirements remain the same and you will be doing other things as you already are doing and expanding on that? 
So the will same. that minimum number stay the same? I doubt it. But again, we can't build competency-based training until we do this statewide job task analysis that will allow us to come to agreement on what the job is, what the criteria is, and what the skills are that are needed. And then from there, we um, build the training to deliver the skills. And it's at that time we'll know how long it takes us to deliver the training. Uh, we, there, you know, there is a model for building tr curriculum. I think it's approximately, it, it, I think it's around 30 hours to build one hour mm -hmm. of training and another, I think 40 hours if it's remote and involves technology, et cetera. So my guess is that um, if anything, you'll see more time, but I, I can't promise you that. I would imagine that it would be more quality time and embedded throughout in a much more measurable way. And again, one more thing is that this is tier training. So this is, you know, what you get at the academy. Remember, that's 101. You are certified to begin your career. This allows for us to have the next level and the next level and that topic for supervisors and the next level, mid-management, management and command. All should be available for all of law enforcement because it's incorporated. Thank you. So that, that perfectly explains what I'm trying to ask. The tier one, I guess you would call it, new recruits who are graduating out of the academy will continue to receive X number of hours, but then as they move up in the tiers and have more expertise, areas of expertise, they will receive different training. But you just said yourself that it takes about 30 hours to, um, to develop a new hour of curriculum. So during that time period, I would hate to see these folks just sort of um, receiving whatever whatever they, you're able to give them for training um, and not have a prescribed amount of training in the interim process. And maybe I just am not being clear, but I see a few other heads nodding. So maybe people are understanding what I'm saying. And I see that someone has a hand up. So maybe you have an answer for me. I would hope. Um, I started doing this work as a volunteer, um, oh God, 10 years ago now and became a paid person only in 2020. Um, when I started doing the basic training in fair and impartial policing, um, it was roughly two hours. Um, we currently have it up to six hours and it is currently being woven into other parts of the curriculum, as I mentioned before, and giving you a time um, about that is not really possible because I can't really speak to what other instructors are doing with fair and impartial policing in their classes on use of force, for instance. Um, that's not, what I can only tell you is that number has increased in the time that I've been doing this from two to six hours, and it's we're also looking at increasing it now. But not um, specifying that you're going to give six hours of training. Yeah, that is in fact specified, in fact. But if we pass this bill, it will be struck. And so you're suspicious that we will go backwards if we do. I don't that. really know what I'm suspicious of because I have no experience with law enforcement officer training. So I'm merely questioning what I don't know and trying to get an answer for what I don't know. So well, I guess my point is I, I'm not sure that the answer is available beyond right. what you've been given. Thank you. Um, that may in fact be the case. That does not, however, mean <clears throat> that everyone's ready to go backwards on this. Oh, I'm sure no one wants to go backwards. I mean, this is this is a very important part of officer training. I just would like, I, I'm a rules person. I would like to see it specified in rules. Thank you. Well, and I think, Doctor, didn't you say that there, there is a, another option of keeping hours, but 
uh, also extending uh, this these trainings? Great. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just, I, as I said, using that old saw, you know, that horrible metaphor, I really think it's possible in this case to have your cake and eat it too. I think you could take the number of hours that people are putting in now and just say, use that as a raw minimum and then let it grow, which it will assuredly do. So I want to go to Representative Waters Evans' uh, question. I, um, I don't want to go in a in an endless loop on this question, I do want to address the concerns and the anxieties around this before we, we pass the bill. Um, and I appreciate um, Dr. Nasser Mago's uh, suggestion that maybe we you know put some sort of a floor. Um, so I, I just want to ask before we move on from this, um, Dr. Simons, if we if we weave in like a, a minimum threshold for fit training, with a, with a, I, I guess in order to accomplish what we're trying to do here, maybe with a, with a qualifier that talks about um, the ability to include that in in other, uh, you know, that it's not specific. It doesn't need to specifically be a class on fair and impartial policing, um, but that that training could be a minimum number of hours that's included, um, and maybe we can work on that over the lunch. To, to sort of square the circle here, because the idea, the flexibility we're trying to give you is to not have to teach a block of fair and impartial policing training, but to have the flexibility to meet the standards and also weave this into other types of uh, training that are being provided. Um, so I don't want to go backwards by having that floor then you know mean that you have to continue to just talk at uh, a class of recruits, for instance, for a specific block of time. Um, I don't know if, if there's a, a suggestion there about how we might sort of create that uh, that minimum without sort of tying your hands again. Well, I, I would say uh, I agree with that, uh, what Eitan is saying. Um, we're not hung up on ours. We're mostly focused on um, the idea that we can be a skill-based profession. And I just want to be clear outside, you know, whatever structure or vehicle that we use to move this in the short time that I've been executive director, I have not heard from one officer or chief or sheriff or anyone from command that they want less training. This is a profession that has asked for more training, more skills, additional time to the academy, more in-service resources, more opportunities to make sure that we get it right, more money to, for backup and um, for backfill for and positions to make sure that each of their departments are as ready as they possibly can to not just meet the community needs, but also the safety needs of their own department. So I, you know, I didn't mean to, I certainly don't mean to sound aggressive, but I, you know, for us, the hours just aren't a measurement of skill. That's all we're saying, but, uh, but this is what they're asking for. They want to get it right. And we are not other states, we're Vermont, and we're doing extraordinary work. And um, I too did not come from law enforcement, but I came from high liability training background and corrections background. And, um, and that is in the criminal justice system. And this work is no joke and it can bring you to your knees. And there's so much more that we have to do in support of these folks that are doing the work, learning as fast as they can, accommodating um, the transition in leadership and changes in the workforce. And I just wanna, you know, sorry for the soapbox, but I, if I don't sound clear, it's because at some point we do get in to, um, to, you know, to the impact of this on officers and law enforcement emotionally, which is they're working as hard as they can in this Vermont, in this state. And Vermont is leading in many areas, not catching up. So I'll just leave it there. And, and that, your question was, can we live with something with ours? Yes. Okay, so what I may, what I may do is, uh, I, I think I have an idea. Uh, so I'm gonna fire that off to legislative council right now as we're continuing our discussion and 
Uh, we'll see if that uh, kind of helps address this, but uh, so I have some hands up in the room, Representative Morgan, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to Mr. Boone. So I, um, I'm listening to what Rep. Hango is saying. I, I too am a rules person. I spent 38 years in the military, so I get working in lanes and getting correct training. And I've seen the pendulum in that 38 years. I saw the pendulum swing both directions and certain trainings. Somebody would get the, as we used to call it, the good idea theory lands on their shoulder and they go, hey, we should try doing this training this way or that training that way. And and then the pendulum swings one way and they're like, oops, too far. So you're correct. And so I've seen that seesaw effect. So I understand her concern um, because this is public safety we're talking about first and foremost, and then all of the other things fall below it, in my opinion, because we have to look at making sure that we put competent officers on our streets that do good work that is fair and impartial and but yet um, takes care of the bad guys, I guess, to be blunt, but because that's the majority of what those folks do. Um, but uh, I, I, I understand her concern slash frustration to make sure that we don't just water something down. I don't think I'm hearing that. I believe I, I'm hearing that that's not the case at all, actually. And that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but I but I understand what she's saying. So I but I, but I think we're it's not like we're going in the right direction. Um, and we'll see what the chair comes up with for language. Thank you. And Waters Evans. Thank you. Um, I, it, it, it's appealing, I think, and important that people aren't just doing their requisite four hours and then that's kind of you're done, right? And you can just say, okay, they're, they're moving on, right? Um, I'm curious about something like role play, for instance, like when you said when you're evaluating them, can you or somebody talk a little bit about something that seems like it might not be a totally objective set of criteria? You know, like, can you just kind of walk me through it? Because it, it, the concept of it, I think, is is really important. I think it's critical not only to weave it into, you know, every a part of all of the training. Um, and I was glad to hear you say that that's happening. I'm just wondering about about you mentioned that there's you know a rubric for these different things for for the evaluators um can you just talk a little bit about that and 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 also what would happen if, if someone went through the training you know did the exercises and were found to not be competent what would happen next i'll be i'll be glad to answer that um in terms of role playing so when you talk about role playing and scenario based training, yeah. all they should always be scripted with intended outcomes, and that role players have to do. They are it's like an actor; they have to do it, hit specific marks, and then the person being evaluated has to hit those specific marks. And there is actual grading and rubric for that. What you find today in most most law enforcement training is this ad hoc role playing that doesn't necessarily involve scripted scenarios with grading rubrics. Um, that is a core component and a needed component when we when you develop training. Um, and with that being said, my opinion is that a, um, a failure in a role playing graded scenario is no different than taking a test, a written test. It would require remediation and everything else that goes along with it. So in my view, those grading rubrics for role plays and practical scenarios and skills would carry the same weight as a written test would. Um, that That's my position on that. Thanks. Other questions from the committee? I think the um, the plan uh, is that I would like to suggest, um, and I'm looking for the appropriate place here. Um, we have, if you look at the, the bill itself at the top of page three, you know, we've said that in order to remain certified, law enforcement officers shall receive a refresher course on the training required by the subsection. So that's fair and impartial police training during every odd number year in a program approved by the, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. And then we've added designed to demonstrate a chief law enforcement officer competency in fair and impartial policing. 
if we added onto that comma uh, a minimum number of hours requirement, would that address the concern that Representative Hango you brought up? So go ahead. Thank you. We have two draft 2.2s on our website. Which one are you? The one that's actually a draft. One is an overview of the draft. Okay. That's a summary from Legislative Council. Page? The other is the draft. Top of page three is the new language. The paragraph begins on the bottom of page two. So just recall here that if you look at all of section two, so it's starting in the middle of page two, mm -hmm. we've got our minimum training standards and definitions. We're not changing anything about paragraph one that talks about fair and partial policing policy. What we're striking was a piece that really should have been session law. It got put into the green books, but it should have been session law that that going way, way back to when the statute was created, there really wasn't much of a focus on fair and impartial policing. A lot has changed in the last few years. We've come an, an enormous way. And we talked about this in the context of the bill we passed yesterday um, and the evolution that Director Simons and Dr. Nasr and Longo talked about um, the, the standards that our guests from IADList um, are talking about. The changes in law enforcement training on these issues have evolved a lot in the last few years. So this just hours requirement that we had that should have been in session law, I think what we're hearing from our witnesses is that it wouldn't hurt at all to create some kind of minimum number of hours because they're already doing way more than that. So if it'll make us feel like we haven't abandoned that requirement, um, I'm wondering, we've talked a little bit, um, I guess my question for Director Simons um, and Deputy Director Raquel probably, is that we've gotten away, uh, uh, we may have talked a little bit about what a uh, person who's attending the first uh, training at the academy gets versus the every two years. Um, and so if we're talking about the um, requirement for um, the sort of refresher course um, where we have this language designed to demonstrate achieve law enforcement officer competency in FIP, what would be sort of a reasonable minimum number of hours there? Because um, I'm a little bit, um, foggy on exactly how many hours of CEUs uh, that training is really doing for. in for and you're talking about in-service training for FIP? Exactly. Yeah. It's, um, is it 2.5 a ton? Yes. And it's every other year? Yes. Yeah. So I, I don't, I, I won't weigh in on how many hours, um, but if it's in statute that also says that's all they have to take. Yeah, if we if we put um, if we if we make it clear that it's a minimum threshold. See, this is the thing I was trying to avoid <laughs> with yeah. the number of hours. Is I do not ever want to interpret it as a floor yeah, or, or as a ceiling. Rather, I, I it would I want to make it really clear it's a floor. So the the emphasis would be on the language we have, which which which, which is that it demonstrates competency. But I'm just I'm. Uh, trying to get the, the committee to have a, a unanimous vote here on this bill. So I want to address this anxiety. Uh, Representative Hango, go Thank ahead. you. Can, um, maybe Tim can answer this question because I see him on section two. Is this referring to the um, initial training a recruit gets at the academy or is this, um, are we talking about the in-service training that um, Director Simons just talked about? I'm a little bit confused, like where where this session law is. Um, what was that referring to? That minimum of four hours of training. Sure, You're muted, that. Tim. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Please. Sure. Um, thank you for your question, Representative Hango. The what appears on line sixteen, that subsection two, which is um, uh, proposed to be struck here. Um, this is kind of an uh, interesting bit of language um, that I think is probably best uh, conceived of as something that should not have been codified, but should have been 
um, put into session law because it puts in a timeline as December by December 31st, 2018, a requirement that all law enforcement officers should re receive four hours of training. And that's kind of the way it reads. It's kind of a one off. And so it would just it's kind of a snapshot in time. And uh, it can be construed, I should say, that and this is where there's some ambiguity in the law, which probably should be addressed here. Um, that it can be conceived, construed as to just um, really those officers that were employed or certified as law enforcement officers as of January, December 31st, 2018, they needed four hours and that was it. Um, and then subsection three would that entail um, every odd number year refresher course. Uh, so there's that's how I would um, kind of characterize um, the language at play here. Uh, is, is that helpful? Um, that's super helpful, Tim. One other thing I would ask that I think might help even further is that the ambiguity that this brings, really, there is no ongoing statutory number of hours required for that refresher course in current statute, right? That is correct. So we're not actually removing a number of hours that's specified in current law. We're getting rid of a requirement that by 2018, all law enforcement in the state have four hours of training. But once that item in number two on line 16 to 18, once we got past December of 2018, it's not like there was any ongoing statutory minimum number of hours in current law. Ah. Well, and I would say, that there therein lies the rub it can be interpreted one of two very different ways okay thank you go ahead Representative. so after all of our discussion i did interpret it the way that tim just explained it and then i go back to section one the purpose of this whole bill is to achieve increased competency over prescribed minimum hours of training if we have no prescribed minimum hours of training in law, in statute, then how are we going to emphasize achieving increased competency? What is that doing for us? It's basically telling us what we're already doing. And then I go on to the next section below um, the stricken language in number two, and then we have number, we have letter F, sorry. <laughs> um, that the criteria for also stricken the criteria for all minimum training standards, um, you know, on and on about a ride and then on or before December 31st, 2021, which I understand that should not even be in here. It should be in session law. Law enforcement officers shall receive a minimum of 16 hours of training. So my feeling is this was put into this was codified into law. Um, and probably should be in session law because it was trying to bring everybody up to speed to where we wanted to be at that point in time. We wanted all law enforcement officers to be on the same page. But now going forward from 2016 and 2018, we want law enforcement officers to have equivalent training to each other. Everybody from all different agencies should have this equivalent training. What is that equivalent training going to be? Right now, it appears that there's no specified equivalent training in statute for number of hours of that training. And we're envisioning that there's going to be this um, competency-based training, which we're already doing anyway, and we're going to hopefully expand on it because nobody wants less training. So why do we need this bill? So this isn't the only thing in this bill, <laughs> but it was the piece of this bill that d does two things. First of all, it clears up this ambiguity about the number of hours from 2018, and it clears up that we don't expect every single law enforcement officer to do a ride. We're giving the flexibility to the Criminal Justice Council to provide the a ride training and not specify the number of hours of a ride training to those officers who can actually make use of it. Because Where's that part? That's, well, that's, that's by striking part. the, the A-Ride section. Okay, that, that makes sense right. to me. But the purpose then of this bill doesn't sound right to me. 
It just doesn't capture what we're doing. Basically, we're ask, we're striking two things that should be in session law, and we're adding the request for a report. In that part of the bill, yes. And then there's uh, the other sections of the bill have nothing to do with the, the these training pieces we're discussing today, because I think we right. talked about those. But agnostic. those are not addressed in a purpose either, are they? So your concern right now is about section one? <laughs> I guess so. I'm I'm okay. all over the map on Here's this. Here's what I think we're going to do. This is just a really confusing bill. Uh, I don't think it's that confusing. as that confusing, but I think um, your opinion. Uh, <laughs> we're we're going to try to reduce confusion here uh, this morning and by this afternoon. Have everybody on the same page. <clears throat> so just want to take us back up and out of this kind of technical conversation and say. We, we have been asked by the folks who train our law enforcement as you know, represented by Director Simons and the guests today, folks who are involved uh, with the creation of the curricula for our law enforcement officers as they you know, get trained. We've been asked by them to put in statute that we wanna move away philosophically from minimum hours to competency. And so there's a the purpose I think captures that captures that especially in regard to FIP and the reason we specifically talked about it in regard to FIP is that this committee in the past and I know you weren't here Representative Hango so this is about the historical context was very concerned when they put in that language uh, further down the by December 2018 mm -hmm. language was very concerned about making sure fair and partial policing was, was a point that was all law enforcement officers got some training. There was a real concern from past members of this committee, this body, the legislature, the public about that. In the last few years, we've had amazing law enforcement leadership. The Criminal Justice Council has really evolved. And this is one more step in, in that. So the point of this bill is we're cleaning up some language we're acknowledging what's already happening and we're endorsing the direction that the criminal justice council is going. That's, that's the point of these parts of the bill. I don't have a response. <laughs> okay. So before we break for lunch, we will come back to this uh, at one o'clock today. Um, I will, um, <clears throat> we'll put our heads together uh, as we break here and see um, if we need to specify some kind of minimum number of hours for the, the refresher. But I'm, I'm a little hesitant to do it after the conversation we've had this morning because I don't want it to ever be seen as a ceiling by any future. We could have a different director and a completely different set of people at the Criminal Justice Council and then we go, look, we only got to do two hours of training. It says it right there in statute. So that's the, the fear uh, that my only hesitancy is but I want to get this committee on board. So uh, Representative Higley and then Hank. Yeah, and I don't want to add any more confusion, but again, if you go down to uh, the council's powers and duties under rulemaking, uh, it talks about that A-RIDE enforcement training um, certification, including minimum hours of training, prerequisites and time periods for completion. Uh, in, in that, it mentions minimum hours of hmm. training as well. Right, exactly. And it gives them, them the flexibility. The point is it gives them the flexibility to decide what the minimum hours of training needs to be, not set it in statute. That's that's exactly it, right? Is that, right. Thank you. Is that in the rulemaking? It's giving the Criminal Justice Council, the experts that, that are doing that, uh, that flexibility. Representative Hango and then Representative Waters. Up Thanks. Up. I just want to say don't do anything about minimum number of hours on my account because I am not a law enforcement training expert. I have no idea what minimum hours should be. I don't need that. Um, however, I do think that the introductory paragraph where it says introduced by the Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs explains this bill a lot better than the purpose, which is section one. Um, so I don't know if that would make it easier because this introductory paragraph does not appear in the books, right? When the, the laws are put into the books. 
Tim, I believe the way this is written, uh, this is not findings. This is a statement of purpose that would actually be included. So can you clarify that for us? Sure. The state of purpose, sorry, the statement of purpose, um, starting on line five of page mm -hmm. one, that will not appear in law. Okay. The section one stated purpose of page two, line four, running through page eight, that would be codified. That's what I thought. That, that's what I thought. Right. Really, the, yeah. Ling Sorry, no. No, I, I spoke too soon. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> section one is um, uh, session law that would appear as an annotation to the remaining language and that will be codified. It will not be statutory language, but it will be memorialized in the annotations uh, that um, session law typically appears as. Sorry. So I do not have strong feelings about the section on purpose. So yeah. if, if it would help the committee at all, happy to edit that over lunch, uh, happy to strike it. Uh, <laughs> findings are not, uh, but I, I, I think we, we put that in the drafts in order to give people a sense of what the heck are you doing by striking this? So, uh, because we, you know, I anticipated, and I think many of us did um, that it would make folks who were around when that requirement, the 2018 requirement was created, uh, a little nervous to just be getting rid of those, minim those minimum hour requirements. So th this is the, uh, the struggle is that we've been trying to be really transparent about what we're doing. Um, so if folks have strong feelings about the findings language, uh, that is, since it'll be in session law, I think it I think it helps say why we're trying to to do what we're doing and provide some context. But if anybody feels strongly about it, I'm happy to, to work on it because it's it's not the <laughs> it's meant to help people understand why we're doing what we're doing. It's not the thing we're doing. Does anybody have strong feelings about it? Representative Watson, oh, let's go ahead. I don't have strong feelings about that. Okay. It, it, I mean, I think it's fine the way it is. Okay. Um, but I had a different <clears throat> comment. Yeah, please. We want to we get everything on the table we need to work on before. <laughs> yes, we. I think that all this talk about hours and all of this stuff, but the conversation that we had this morning alleviated any concerns that I had had previously before we got to this point. Um, I think the the hard kind of conceptual leap is taking is is going from having this like concrete set period of time that we know this is going to happen to putting um i guess it's putting trust into the people who are developing the curriculum and who are doing the training um which seems counterintuitive to making a law but that we have this check back now worked into it which is enables which enables us to move forward with that trust over a period of time um, and then reevaluate how things are going, which makes me feel terrific about the whole thing. Great. I'm glad. That's, That's it. <laughs> we like feeling terrific. Yeah. Uh, it's not, go ahead, please. <laughs> I would simply, right now I'm speaking as chair of the RDAP and not as one of the people who does some of the straining. Um, I would encourage you, if at all possible, to include in the language of the bill um, a an understanding of that that the change to a focus on skills and competency is directly in line with the stated goals that have been put forth across state government to increase um, transparency and accountability to historically stigmatized communities. That's all. Would you do me a huge favor if you're willing, which would be, would you send me an email with with that? Because I wouldn't mind adding something to that effect to our statement of purpose to strengthen it. Uh, anyway. Sure, absolutely. By when? Please uh, don't say like 10 minutes. Uh, we, yeah, so if, if, if you would be willing to do that uh, in the noon hour, uh, I could ask uh, um, Mr. Devlin, who's our legislative counsel, to, to add that for the draft that we'll look at after lunch. So okay. Anytime in the next half hour, 45 minutes, something like that, I think would be plenty of time. Will do. Okay. Thanks.
If, if you're going to suggest we add something, then I, I'll flip that back to you. That's what, that's what happens sometimes here. <laughs> it's like the military. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I, but I, in all seriousness, I think um, you captured something that's a desire that we many of us on the committee had in, in doing this. And I want to make it clear to our colleagues who weren't part of this really intense conversation, what we're actually doing here. Um, okay in endorsing a move to competency over minimum hours. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so committee, we're at noon. Uh, I really, really deeply appreciate Director Simons, uh, the gentleman from my ad list. Uh, thank you for spending this time with us this morning and uh, helping us sort of get uh, this philosophical and statutory cleanup uh, bill done. Uh, we will break now and uh, be back to pick this up again at one o'clock. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Have a clean copy of the bill then? Uh, absolutely. So okay. what, what, what we will have, I'm hoping, when we come back at one, um, is uh, an updated draft um, to that will include, hopefully, um, Dr. Nasrat and Mondo's suge mm -hmm. suggestion to um, add to the uh, why we're doing this and what, what our hopes are for it. And then, um, We'll do a walkthrough with Tim. We also have uh, a couple of um, folks, uh, Karen from the network and um, Chief Lamoth, uh, both wanted to offer um, some perspective before we do our final uh, walkthrough. So we will hear that, the testimony at one, take a look at a uh, clean draft, and then uh, hopefully wrap up our work.